Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. One of the biggest questions that Julie and I get is not just how to basically build wealth, primarily as a real estate practitioner, but how to keep it once you have it. Uh, it seems like a lot of people... Um, you know, this is a Warren Buffett quote. Of course, it's not exact, but it's sort of, sort of Tim's version of a Warren Buffett quote. Um, he said that he was never impressed with people who built their fortunes and lost it just to, re, just to have to rebuild them. He said he was always more impressed with people that built their fortunes and didn't lose them in the first place. And that's always stayed with me because the fact is, is that that's the truth, that you shouldn't have to basically go through this uh, learning, earning, and then losing cycle like so many people suffer from. And if you would ever take the time and study what it is about people, uh, what were the exact reasons why people have financial setbacks after they've obtained some level of financial security? Why is it? What is it? How is it that that happens? It really always comes down to one thing. And everybody, I hope you guys are listening. <laughs> Here's the punchy way of saying it. I've never seen anybody go bankrupt from having no debt. That's the answer. So Julie and I are uh, flying, uh, don't remember where from or where to, and this was a while ago, and Julie was sitting across the aisle, and um, maybe I'll have her tell her own story. I think we were flying to Orange County, California, or flying out of Orange County, California, and, and this was back in the crash, um, and Julie was uh, sitting next to this guy who was in charge of, I'm going to tee it up for you, Julie, so make sure we're telling the same story, who was mm -hmm. uh, in charge of, and this this guy was famous, at least famous amongst business wonks, and he was on financial channels at the time doing a lot of speaking. His area of expertise was basically doing um, financial reorganizations, which was a fancy way of saying he would go there basically and sell off assets of companies that become financially Twice distressed. And yeah. Yes. And his, and his main uh, source of business was like the FDIC, you know, the government. So this is back during the height of the shit show that was the real estate crash that obviously had ramifications throughout the economy. And Julie had this very nice, long conversation with this guy. And I only eavesdropped to some of it. Julie, do you remember that conversation, the things that he told you that yeah. caused big companies to get into trouble? It's It's been a while, so you'll have to help me remember some of this. But I do remember mm -hmm. that he said partnerships were one thing. He said that overspending, over leveraging, not watching their bottom line was a major um, error in their ways. Uh, I, th I mean, those are the themes that I remember from him talking about that and some combination of those things, having too many chefs in the kitchen, taking on partners, selling off parts of the business to quote investors um, and basically being massively over leveraged. And I remember being surprised because I believe that he was, I think it was flying to Orange County and he was headed to uh, I remember now. basically St. analyze Regis. one of the hotels. Yeah, I think it was the St. Regis. The St. Regis. And I, I remember yep. being surprised, like you hearing about one of these big established businesses that, that, boy, that sure sounds like some of these real estate teams and brokerages and taking on partners and overspending and throwing everything on a credit card and praying to the real estate gods that everything will work out. Because, you know, your mind naturally goes to try and making connections. But that was an interesting conversation. And that was what he did for a living for giant companies. And I, I think at I, the time. Me, it, I didn't realize that job existed. I thought that was kind of interesting that somebody does at, that. At the time, I believe that was the largest, like, I think it was either private bankruptcy or corporate bankruptcy. I don't remember what it was, but that was the gist of it. And the takeaway was basically one of the biggest no-nos that you can do as a small business, medium business, large business, individual, anything, anything is take on too much debt. That's really because the debt becomes unsustainable if the economy changes. A lot of people take out debt uh, with the assumption that things are going to keep op operating at the same level that they will, you know, forever and ever. And, and of course they don't, things change. So if you guys were to really drill down, on what are the things that cause people, remember the topic is how to get it. Now we're gonna be moving into the how to keep it stage of the conversation. So if you look at your, if you look at folks that you know, and Julie and I've seen this happen in the real estate industry especially, we've been through 
really arguably four recessions in our in our uh, working lifetimes. And the last one, obviously, will be known, I promise you guys, as a depression, not a recession. Um, but so during that time, you will see people who are successful, not just in our industry, but in every industry, who were over leveraged, they will basically come unraveled really, really fast. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to tell you guys sad stories, but there are I tell this story occasionally, and I'm going to tell it now, too, because I think it's it was very impactful. Julie and I, it was uh, 2007, I think it was June. We got invited to a KW thing, and we went out, and we ended up being in a boardroom talking to uh, Willis. What was his first name, Julie? Can you Google that real quick? I want to give this guy Mark? full credit. I don't I remember. Mark. Mark Willis. Thank you. Yeah. Mark was the then CEO of Keller Williams. And Mark, had, Julie and I got there a little bit late, and he was just giving some big speech to thousands of agents, and the room was full. And we were invited to have private meetings with all the executives at the time, guys, they were trying to recruit us. That was what was going on there. Diana Kokoska and, you know, great, great, wonderful people. And we'd seriously contemplated working with them. But anyway, we were in this room, this big conference room uh, with Mark. And after he'd given this uh, long speech, he comes back into the room and, you know, he was kind of like of two minds. You could tell when he walked into the room, really, really, really wonderful guy. Some of you guys know him. And he walked into the room and he was a little bit like not there. And at the same time, you could tell he was trying to be like a salesman of sorts. He was trying to be nice and friendly. He was a Texan after all, you know, from Dallas. So he's trying to be like a, you know, classical, um, you know, that kind of person. And gregorious, demonstrative, that's what I'm saying. But at the same time, there was something that was, you know. And so he sat down with us. He goes from this big, you know, shoulders back, tall guy, sits down in this chair across from Julie and I. And then he starts asking us, did we hear the speech? And we heard, I'd say probably 50% of it. And he asked what we thought. And this is the first time meeting with him. So of course, we're not going to be critical, a great speech, whatever. And then he kind of leans forward and kind of slumps in his chair. And I'll never, ever forget this. And he said, um, I'm, I'm not sure about it. Or I, I don't remember his exact words, but it was this moment of pure leadership and unbelievable integrity that kind of came out of him. And by the way, I've since said this to him and he didn't even remember having this experience with us, which is kind of funny, but that's okay. So I do, Julie does. So he had mm -hmm. uh, this, he started telling us the story of, or he started telling us about how he was in Texas selling real estate uh, during the oil crisis in the eighties and how he saw the effect of that crashing economy on his just named off all of his friends, family members, he started talking about people that had killed themselves and divorces. And so he wasn't having a financial, you know, house depreciation type question. He was talking about the human impact of any kind of, uh, you know, crisis of debt. Um, and he thought, and he said this, that he didn't necessarily convey that with enough conviction to the group, which I didn't have an opinion of. And I still don't because I don't really remember his speech, to be honest with you. Um, you know, and so I thought that was very interesting. And so we ended up having a nice meeting and, you know, the, just what you'd expect. But the fact that he was very transparent about what he was really thinking as the CEO of now what's the largest real estate brokerage in the world. I think that's something that has stayed with Julie and I. We'd certainly seen the effects of previous recessions, but nothing like what Mark would, you know, he was correct that the 2007 crisis, which started in 2006, arguably, you know, it got much worse, as some of you guys will remember. Some of you, most of you guys are in real estate. At least 50% of the 126,000 of you listening right now are in real estate. But you know what? That stayed with us. And when we, at the time, we just left our, we were coaching for another organization. And we started, restarted our own organization. We'd kind of put it on hiatus for five years, basically, and went back, you know, dusted it off and re, you know, basically started our own coaching company again. But anyway, at that time, I, I remember what he said, and then we saw what he said play out in, in, our, in just technicolor for the next like three or four years. We saw people that had been at the top of the world, who'd been the most successful people that you could possibly imagine. I'm talking about the private jets and the private yachts and the just all the, Julie, what's the word? Accouperment? Accouterment. There's your, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. No I, saw it. I don't even want to try to say it. Then I'll screw up saying audible. Hey, I think I said it right. Anyway. So we got into the situation where, like, you know, we saw all these things starting to happen. And I remember Mark kind of like reminding us. And then we had those other experiences. Like I would, Julie just told you her story about the guy on the plane. And we had then then this is true story in 2010 or 2011. We find ourselves in Italy 
And we find ourselves having a conversation with one of the big, biggest personal business managers in Hollywood. One of these very business manager, not agent. So business managers are accountant types. They keep their heads down. They take care of people's finances, but not only for celebrity types, but also for other folks as well. Very, very sweet guy. And he had incredible perspective because he's been dealing with these big ego types forever and helping them manage their money and keep their wealth. And so guess what he said? <laughs> we told him our philosophy on business and money and all the rest of it. And he said, I wish all of my clients had the exact same philosophy. And so everywhere we went, even back in our formidable years in our early 20s, the, con the re recurring message from everybody was always the same thing. And every time we were, every time we didn't listen with both ears, uh, we paid the price of it. And some of you guys are paying that price now because no one maybe has ever, you maybe have never been, been exposed to, I think, this level of truth. The reality of it is, is are the things that are going to set you back on your heels financially are always the same thing. Too much debt, not having adequate health insurance, divorces. So you have health problems, you have too much debt. You have uh, emotional problems from divorces, and then you have taxes. It's those four things. So you can mitigate the risk from all four of those things. Uh, pay your taxes on time, right? Um, we talked about forming corporations and how you guys should set yourselves up as, you know, not as independent contractors or self-employed, but how you should be employees of your own company. We've talked about that many times in the show before. Um, as far as like, you know, that'll take care of your taxes because it'll put you on a steady, you know, discipline of paying your taxes on time, which will be a big relief for many of you. Again, I know nobody tells you this. I know your broker hasn't told you this. Your accountant doesn't tell you this. You know, most people don't discover how taxes actually work until they get a nice little letter from the IRS. And then you have a big eyes opening experience. Well, so you can mitigate that by just listening to what your coaches are telling you now. So you don't have to have that experience. Health insurance, guys, there's a, you know, there's a lot of hacks for health insurance. We talked about that before. Um, you know, to summarize, every single one of you can afford health insurance. Um, there's different ways to go about doing that. Um, and but we aren't, we're not going to talk about health insurance now. But the biggest uh, way to make it so that you no longer or you never have a big health, a health bill, or at least less than the likelihood of it is stay healthy. Duh. That's the reason Julie and I you know, overtly and covertly as often as we can try to convince you guys to go to things like Orange Theory, you know, keep your body in good shape. Because by the way, our main wheelhouse, which is obviously helping you guys build your businesses and build money, all those things go hand in hand. When your body's in great working order, so will your mind. And when your mind's in great working order, so are your wallet. Um, and as far as personal relationships go too, that's obviously something that's not, you know, that really in the, our wheelhouse. Some of you guys really like it when Julie and I talk about those things. But that's really, I'll tell you where you should go if you want to learn more about how to manage your personal relationships, how to manage your real, your, you know, marriages or your partnerships. By partnerships, I mean, if you're not married, you know, whatever. Uh, Dr. Laura Schlesinger, read her books. If you guys really want to get into down and dirty on how to manage your personal finances, there's nobody better than Dave Ramsey. Some people shit on Dave Ramsey because he's an overt Christian, but listen to what I'm telling you. Nobody gives better advice about getting your personal financial house in order than Dave Ramsey, Right. Okay, nobody gives better relationship advice on how to get your life in order than Dr. Uh, Laura Schlesinger. Those are our, I, there's no, Julie, any, you want to, any footnotes nope, to I, those points? I would agree with that. I would agree with yep. that. And all of this takes action and actively working on it. You know, you can't really passively take care of yourself physically. Some mm -mm. of you know what it's what the results of being passive about relationships are. And the IRS is awfully clear when you're passive about paying them. So get out of passive and into active on all of these topics, and you'll see that they go hand in hand. We often talk about the impact of having yourself together physically on how that works out for you fiscally. They absolutely are intertwined. And many of our best coaching members, clients, students that are at the top of their game it's not just because they're great at prospecting, marketing, lead following up, and you know presenting. It's also because they're really good at taking care of themselves, financially, mentally, emotionally, physically. It is all related. So don't kid yourself and think that you can work on one without the others, or that you can you know be passive on certain things but not others. It's actually easier to actively work on all of these things because they do go hand in hand. You know, when you work out, you have more energy to run your business properly, for example. When you are in better shape physical, physically, you're more attractive to your relationships, okay? So that's related. And when you are in better shape, you also are less likely to get sick, which relates to, you know, health insurance and all the rest. 
sell. I think there's a lot to this. There's not like a, uh, you know, pull the trigger and everything will happen for you. It, there's a lot of pieces that you've got to watch. Go ahead. And guys, it's it's okay if you're off the path, right? I mean, really what Julie just said, I was impressed, frankly, what she just said. I hope you guys were listening. You know, it's basically about honoring your commitments. That's really what it is at the end of the day. It's honoring your commitments to your family, to your spouse, honoring your commitments to yourself, to God. It's honoring your commitments. That's what it is. That's what this is all about. It's knowing that you've made a commitment and just following through on it. The um, feeling that you get from having the character of being the person that honors his or her commitments is incredible. That is in its own way, essentially being rich. But so look, we're all about practical, tactical. I'm finding my skin starting to crawl because we're meandering into the mindset world, which we're not big advocates <laughs> of. <laughs> so what we it's giving me hives, making me sweat. So look, practically and tactically speaking, guys, Julie, what point were we on? All right, let's take a look here. I believe that we are, we talked about multiple spokes, patience and perseverance. Ah, I think point number five is where we left off. Okay, like so it. go for it. Yeah, no, okay, please so do. We're, we're talking about not just creating wealth, but how the wealthy keep their wealth. So point number five, patience and perseverance. 80% of millionaires acquire that level of wealth after age 50. It takes time to create wealth. Make decisions quickly and correct course if necessary. Get the train on the tracks. And one of the things that I thought of when I was researching this and I wrote that point, I should have included this, was the percent of self-made millionaires versus what many people believe that, you know, you're only that wealthy and you only stay that wealthy when you've inherited that wealth. And that's such a micro percent versus what people actually think. I should have included that. So related well, to that, most millionaires, it happens after age 50. Go ahead. So, but just in case you guys didn't hear the first part of this two-part show, which you should go back and listen to, the uh, gist of it was that we're not talking about you know trying to compete with Warren Buffett for the you know newest jet. <laughs> we're just talking about basically being rich, and rich is where your money works for you. You no longer have to work for your money. Getting to the point where you have enough passive income coming from, frankly, uh, we think uh, real estate investments, and those real estate investments then produce enough net income to cover all your personal overhead. We kind of drove, drilled down on that. By the way, if you guys want really detailed information on this, because there's only so much we can cover in a half hour every day on this podcast, just buy our book. You know, It's like less than 20 bucks. It's on Amazon. It's called Harris Rules, number one international bestseller. Thousands, well, at this point, tens of thousands of copies have been sold. And uh, we're talk. There's a lot of specific details on wealth building, which in the last three chapters, I think. So just get that book and download it. Um, yeah, and get the audio book too. The gal who uh, did the audio version, I think, did an awesome job. We're getting great feedback on her uh, her voice. It's fantastic. So listen, you guys, J Julie's just point. Okay, it was Julie. I do remember the number. Only like three percent of all the people who are millionaires. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're generational millionaires. Virtually everybody who's a millionaire who or who's rich, you know, by definition, where your money works, you no longer work for your money, has have created it themselves. I have never come across, aside from winning lottery tickets, I've never come across a better vehicle to get there faster than what many of you guys, like, you know, most of you listening do, which is selling real estate. Literally never have come across any other business opportunity um, that was as Easily lucrative. There's an interesting two couple words put together, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Easily lucrative as selling real estate. You know, it is. It's a brilliant, incredible, unbelievably powerful gift from God. Having a real estate license provide you know how to use it just like everything else. You know, if you don't, then it's basically a, a burden. Um, so before we get to the next point, I've been receiving emails. You guys were, some of you were a little frustrated last week because you couldn't get a free coaching call, we've caught up. So just go to freecoachingcallsforagents.com, freecoachingcallsforagents.com. And when you do, you will be entitled to a free coaching call with one of our new member coaches. And they're going to be focusing on your lead generation wheel, your multiple spokes that you're going to have for generating leads in 2018, 2019. But you're also going to get six free books. One of the books that uh, we talk about a lot because we get such great feedback on it is real estate treasure map and that's your 2018 fill in the blank business plan it really does take you through a lot of the aspects of your personal and business 
your life plan, really. And that's what it's all about. It's, again, not a touchy feely mindset, you know, let's think about it and hopefully the universal deliver it type thing. It's a very practical and tactical approach, as a lot of you guys won't be surprised, that will get you to where you want to go quicker than just trying to wing it and doing it on your own. That book is free. All you got to do is go to freecoachingcallsforagents.com. You'll be entitled to a free coaching call with one of our new member coaches and also get those six books to download. Next point, Julie. Yes, you got it. Next point is number six, maintain your energy, enthusiasm, and optimism. 71% of millionaires in the CNBC study considered themselves positive about life. They have a strong self-belief in their vision and surround themselves with similarly minded friends, family, and colleagues. Energy and enthusiasm and optimism, very important. Point number seven, 81% of the millionaires in the study said that they actively work at controlling their mindset, their emotions, their thoughts, and their words. Meditation is a common theme amongst them. So as we said before, you have to actively work on this. 81% of millionaires say that they actively work on controlling their mindset. Point number eight, the nope, mindset nope. of giving. Stop. Stop. All right, Stop, hover. Please. Okay, hover. Meditation. All right, there's a word that could be a black hole because no one really knows how to define it. Sure. So I'm going to help you guys basically go through a non-sort of Eastern philosophy approach to it. You can get in a meditative state. Some of you can by um, running. It's true. And it's been tested. Some of you, uh, the whole meditation thing, there's been books. Uh, there's actually a new book, Julie. I got it for you. Uh, audible book. And my phone's not here, so I can't tell you the name of it. But it, there's a new book on meditation um, that is essentially demystifying it. In essence, what meditation is, is trying to basically calm the voices in your mind and make it so that your thoughts aren't just so random. And what they've shown is that if you can get your, it's a brainwave thing. When you can get your brainwaves in this state, this, they call it a meditative state, that you will have an opportunity to feel completely and totally rejuver, rejuvenated emotionally and mentally. And I, I don't meditate as often as I should, but when I do, it's not easy for me. Uh, because as you guys can tell from listening to us every day, I'm probably like many of you where my thoughts are always going everywhere. But when I do do it for about a half hour, sometimes 45 minutes, the after effect, Julie can even tell that I've been meditating. I don't know if I look different or what. Very clear. But yeah, and Julie does it as well. Some of you guys can meditate by, like Julie has, gets into that state by uh, playing music. So don't think that you have to sit around in some sort of, you know, Buddha position with a white bathrobe on, you know, going, oh, and, you know, it doesn't have to be this regimented thing that, you know, that type of thing. Don't think it has to be like that because it really doesn't. Um, and again, when you take sort of a, when you remove the Eastern religion type thing from it and you just look at it for what it is, there's a lot of different ways for you to have the benefit of it without having to go to the ashram in India. Next point, Julie. <laughs> that was pretty well summarized, I think. All right. Very good. Good job demystifying. Yes. So point number eight, the mindset of giving before you get is a common trait amongst the wealthy. The mindset of being of service is prevalent among the rich. Ego follows success, not the other way around. Providing value before expecting results is a clear trait. So how do you digest that in your real estate practice? Well, one of the things that you can do is go to our Facebook page because there's a great story of one of your colleagues there, if you were one of our premier coaching members, who finally, she tells a story, I won't get into it, I don't have it on my screen right now, but she, it's a recent post, and she tells the story of basically getting out of her own way and going ahead and doing better quality lead follow-up, more prospecting, and when she shifted to being the mindset of service and not making it all about how that was making her feel and she didn't feel like doing it and all that kind of stuff, that lo and behold, she started to set more appointments. Huh, curious. And so her synopsis was that, when she got out of her own way and removed her ego and made it all about being of service, how much easier the business has become for her. So that's one salient example most of you can relate to. Point number nine, follow through. Not being a, what we call a sampler, somebody who tries things out, you know, seeing what sticks. You know you're a sampler when you use phrases like, well, I'll try it for a while, we'll see, you know, the skeptic outlook going from thing to thing, expecting it to rain leads on you, for example. Instead, the wealthy follow one course until successful. So if you write down the word focus, that stands for follow one course until successful. That's their theme. They follow through. They don't expect to make a couple of phone calls and then have their success tomorrow. I know sometimes in real estate we get into that rut. <laughs> okay, so follow one course until successful. That means building out one spoke 
and being the best at it and not just dabbling and trying it out. You know, how many people have, have said to us, Tim, over the years, well, you know, I tried calling a FISBO, didn't work. A FISBO, really? You tried one and decided to throw in the towel or any other spoke that you'd like to choose? I tried probate, but, you know, nothing worked out. Well, you tried it for like an hour and a half. That doesn't count. Okay, I get a little bit excited about this. Point number 10. We talked about this a little bit. Physical health and mental well-being. 82% of millionaires in the study stated that they had no significant health issues currently. Being proactive regarding exercise and nutrition is critical to not only achieving wealth, but keeping it. So there's that relationship again between exercise and nutrition and achieving wealth and keeping it. And our final point rounding out the bend here, point number 11, being responsible and accountable. If it's meant to be, it's up to me is the saying, not blaming your broker, your spouse, your market, your background. It is time to take control. You are where you are now due to your past actions, and your future is determined by what you do today, tomorrow, next week, next month, and next year. Failures along the way must be owned as well as the successes. So the wealthy own it. They know they're responsible and accountable to their own success. And I think that's something that I wish was instilled, you know, even in school earlier. You know, some of us have it more than others, but certainly – you don't get along with your real estate license. I wish that happened, but I guess that's why we have coaching. <laughs> so back to you. And I've got to get to Premier. So Julie and I had an interesting conversation the other day, and I probably framed it wrong when I was wanting to have it with her. Julie and I are testing out ideas, bouncing them back and forth um, for the new book, right? So we have a new book coming out early next year. And I was trying to demystify and break through some of the bullshit that a lot of people think about being successful and I was thinking of Sir Richard Branson. And so Julie and I, through, I don't know how to describe it other than just basically social connections, indirectly know him. And we know him to be somebody who is not necessarily like the person who presents himself publicly. When you hear him talk now, he likes to sound like he's some sort of Eastern mystic. You, he likes to talk about some, you know, he's, he's trying to sound basically like a, you know, long haired British Buddha. Whereas in all reality, he's just like the rest of us. He's not special. He's just taking special actions. And, and then that got me thinking about all the other people who have really been, you know, essentially hoisted up on the stage or who like to hoist themselves up on the stage and act like they're special, act like they're, you know, have, were, were born on, you know, third base, even though, you know, and acting like they had, you know, just the whole thing. The reality of it is, is that the thing that makes you special or the thing that will make you not special isn't necessarily anything in your DNA code, how tall, how fat, how short, how nothing. It's the actions you take and the service you provide to other people. It's those two things. It's your willingness to do what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. That's what makes you special. It's not, Julie and I are just ordinary people. There's nothing really special about us. I know some of you guys, when we run into you guys, you guys are very, very nice and you're very demonstrative and you're very like, you know, I appreciate it. I really do. But one of the things I always try and I don't I do not do it very successfully to convey back to you is there there's nothing real. Julie and I have been in situations before in airports and whatnot after we speak at things where we've had some really uncomfortable situations happen where people will ask for autographs and just like just things like that. And I don't I understand, I guess, from a perspective why people react that way sometimes but the fact is is it, it, they missed the message and the message really is is that we're not special what we did was special what the actions we took that's what's unique not us julie and i are just normal couple you know people from ohio we don't have fancy degrees we didn't go to fancy schools we didn't come from rich families there's nothing in our dna or genetics that would in any way make you guys think that we would be anything other than just what we are normal people who took extraordinary actions why am I telling you this? Because you cannot fall prey to people who are making you think that they have some sort of special superpower when they don't. And when, when, when you guys start believing that other people have something that you don't, other than just the actions that they take, that's going to give you an excuse to fail. And I, and I really don't want you guys to fall prey to the believing and to the, you know, the hoisting up of people as idols when all they are is just normal people that took extraordinary actions. That's all we are. And that's all we'll continue to be. And when you run into us, let's just have a normal conversation. What do you say? <laughs> so guys, listen, we really appreciate the great feedback we're getting on our podcast. And thank you for continuing to make our book, Harris Rules, 
the number one international bestseller it is. It's a huge honor, frankly, to be your coach. Some of you future coach. If there's anything we can ever do for you guys, it's Tim at timandjulieharris.com or Julie at timandjulieharris.com. You guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you on the show tomorrow. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. Thank you.